My name is Nkechi Lechi, and I am the policy director of the Nigerian Center. You are all welcome to our State of the Union on Immigration. I'm going to have up Elnora Bassi. She is our policy attorney for the Catholic Legal Immigration Network, Inc. Let's have it up. Welcome, We are going to have the Nigerian Center's very own attorney, April Holloway. You are welcome. We will also have Niels Kunani, Immigration Coordinator for the Congolese Community of Washington Metro. We will also have our very own Diana Conante, Policy Director for African Communities Together. <laughs> welcome, welcome to all of our panelists. And if everyone could maybe fill up the seats in the front row, please, that would be very great um, if you can fill up those seats in the front row. Well, we thank you, all of our panelists, for joining us today during the State of the Union on Immigration. You are all very welcome. So I'm going to ask a series of questions and the purpose of this panel discussion is to really we create curated questions that will help inform our community, those that are not aware of current immigrant relief programs um, and how to be engaged. Thank you so much for joining. Um, this question is for everyone. The President, during the State of the Union, the President addressed the President's address asked Congress to pass the immigration reform bill to provide a pathway to citizenship for DREAMers, those on temporary status, farm workers, and essential workers. What campaign or initiatives are you currently, are your respective organizations involved in that work directly with these affected communities? Um, we can start with Diana. Sure. Um, so my organization works uh, very closely with TPS holders. Um, TPS, Temporary Protected Status, is one of um, our priority issues. Um, and we essentially work to ensure that um, Africans here in the US uh, have status. So our ultimate goal is to get us to permanent status um, for all uh, 300 thousand Africans who are undocumented here, but you know, even broadly, the millions of others as well. Um, but if you don't mind, I would like to talk about the State of the Union and, and the remarks that the President um, made around immigration. In addition to the bill uh, that he talked about um, that would legalize uh, the undocumented community here, uh, what is alarming for us is his continued push for his border bill. The, this is the bipartisan border bill that he worked, um, he has been working on for several months um, with the Senate. Um, essentially, it's a bad bill. Um, we have seen uh, that the provisions in that bill do not work. They are policies that the former administration put into place that had no, uh, that did not decrease the number of folks coming to our southern border. Um, in fact, they increased those numbers. Um, and we have examples that this administration has, um, you know, programs that this administration has um, implemented that has in fact decreased the number of uh, people at the border. So for example, the parole programs that Benga had up on the, on the uh, on the PowerPoint presentation that uh, led to a 97% decrease in those nationalities at the border. So, um, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that folks are aware that the president, despite not being able to get the bill through Congress, the president, uh, uh, you know, continues to move forward with those, those policies. Um, we at African Communities Together oppose those policies um, and are working to make sure that they are not implemented, but um, you know, we are hearing that the administration is looking to do it through executive uh, actions. Um, so just making, sh making you know, want people to be aware um, and you know, hopefully uh, 
when uh, you know there's an opportunity to speak out against it that you will. Thank you Sorry so much. To take no, up so much time. That was awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. And how can people get engaged with African communities together to um, work with your organization against that bill? Sure. I mean, you know, one way to stay in touch with us is to go to our website and join our mailing list, Africans.us. Um, and you know, you'll get information. Follow us on on our social media, um, African at Africans US on on all social media platforms. But you know, things that you can do include just calling your member of Congress, especially um, your senators, because they were the ones. Um, uh, working on this bipartisan uh, piece of legislation, calling them and telling them that you uh, don't support them uh, uh, restricting asylum at the southern border. Um, you don't um, support them, you know, making it harder for people to get asylum in this country. Um, and that instead of um, uh, pursuing policies that uh, uh, are, are uh, demonize immigrants um, and that close off the U.S. to people fleeing uh, violence and, uh, 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 you know, other, other um, life-threatening conditions, that we find ways to support those people by, for example, providing resources to the southern border for, um, um, for processing of individuals, creating legal pathways um, so that people don't have to come to, to the U.S. through the southern border. So again, you know, join our mailing list and uh, call your member of Congress. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Diana. I hope everyone took notes. Um, African.us or African Communities Together's website um, to get involved and engaged. Um, Niels, I can repeat the question if you need it. No, I got it. Thank you. <laughs> so <clears throat> my uh, organization, the Congolese Community of Washington Metropolitan, is leading efforts with other uh, partner organizations to secure a TPS designation for the DRC. So as you, um, uh, you, you heard from Diana, we know that uh, people are being deported. Uh, the president has now fulfilled uh, his promises on immigration and is tending to make it worse. Uh, so, so people are being deported, our family members, our friends, and the DRC, as, as you may know, is, is going through one of the deadliest and longest armed conflict since World War II, or even in modern history. Um, so we have the armed conflict, uh, which you probably see often in the news, but also uh, communal violence, violence between communities throughout the country. Um, so those conditions make it almost impossible for Congolese uh, people, immigrants in the U.S., to safely return home. Um, and we continue to receive reports uh, of violence, attacks toward uh, people, Congolese immigrants who have been deported uh, or forced to return to, to the DRC. And, and some of them uh, have to uh, hide from the government, from armed groups, uh, so, so TPS is very much uh, needed for, for our community, for, for Congolese immigrants. So that's one. And two, uh, we have uh, uh, one of the largest African uh, communities in, in this area in the U.S. We have over uh, 800 members. And what, what deportation does to our community is, is very harmful. Uh, deportation takes uh, our community members away from us, uh, family members, uh, friends, and these are the people that contribute to, to our communities. These are the people that strengthen uh, our, our communities, and we can't afford uh, losing them uh, and sending them to dangerous conditions. Uh, so that's second. And third, um, TPS, we strongly believe that will we'll strengthen uh, our communities uh, will strengthen African uh, uh, community, the diaspora community, and, and also will strengthen uh, the, the U.S. economy, because these are hardworking uh, uh, people that are contributing to the U.S. economy, to our communities, to our families. Um, so 
So that's why the, the Congolese community of Washington Metropolitan uh, is, is leading effort to, to make sure that Congolese immigrants uh, who are present in the U.S. are protected with, with TPS uh, status. Um, so last point, what we have done. Uh, so we uh, started the campaign last year. Uh, we sent uh, our TPS request letter, formal letter to the administration on uh, February 1st. Um, and we have had uh, meetings with uh, the, the, the Department of Homeland Security uh, since they are the ones who uh, can make that decision whether or not to grant TPS in consultation with other agencies. Um, and we also um, had a uh, congressional letter, uh, a letter that was uh, signed by uh, over 50 members of Congress. It was a bicameral uh, uh, letter including um, uh, uh, senators and, and, and representatives, and, and that letter was sent to the administration uh, last year, I believe in, in September, urging them to uh, designate uh, uh, DRC for TPS. And also, uh, lastly, we had a a faith-based letter uh, that was led by clinic. Thank you, Anora. Uh, and and that letter was also sent to the administration again, emphasizing that the country conditions in DRC make it almost impossible uh, for for Congolese immigrants to safely return uh, to to the DRC. Uh, so, how can you help? How can you contribute to this effort? Uh, we are thinking about uh, having another not thinking, we're actually planning. There will be another NGO letter. Uh, so a letter uh, that will be uh, signed up by, uh, led by, 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 uh, by non-government non NGO uh, and, and to, 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 uh, to the administration. The letter will be sent to the administration, again, to, to emphasize that there actually has been a recent spike in, in violence in the DRC um, and, and that uh, TPS is, is crucial uh, and it, it's much needed now. Uh, so uh, one way you can contribute is by signing on to those uh, those, those type of letters um, and, and also uh, reaching out if you have an opportunity to, to talk to congressional offices. Uh, there will also be another letter from Congress. There is actually a letter from Congress now uh, uh, that's being uh, led by uh, uh, Congresswoman Yvette Clark, Jaya Powell, and, and Representative Osford, and, and just like they did last year, but this year also emphasizing the recent spike in violence. So if you're in contact with any congressional offices, please ask them to sign on to that letter um, uh, that will be sent to, to the administration. The letter is set to close, I believe, next week. So uh, next week, Wednesday, uh, March 20th. Uh, so please uh, uh, reach out. Uh, and, and ask congressional offices to sign on. And lastly, um, uh, please uplift uh, our uh, uh, message uh, on social media um, and, and, and to, to uh, uh, government authorities, uh, uh, specifically DHS, uh, the, the State Department, and, and the White House. Uh, and again, thank you so much. Our website uh, is uh, ccwm. Uh, USA. Uh, that, that come. Thank you. Thank you, Mills. You answered most of the other questions. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for that information, and I hope that everyone in the audience was notating all of that information. The purpose of this is for you to be informed and get engaged. Um, yes, the Nigerian Center is also leading a charge for TPS for Nigeria. And on the website, you can find all the resources that the Nigerian Center has compilated that support the designation for temporary protected status. These resources can also be used for people who are applying for asylum. The reason this is important is because on the individual level, if you are applying for asylum in court or before an officer, that person is most likely not educated on the conditions of your country that are leading you to apply for asylum. It becomes your job to educate them on that. So when you provide them with these resources in conjunction with your testimony, you have a much better chance of getting your case granted. 
And I want to tie in what President Biden said with the education piece. President Biden says we want to provide citizenship pathways for people who are TPS holders, dreamers, farm workers, you know, but I guarantee you he doesn't know what that means. Because in order to get citizenship, you first have to get residency. That means we have to remove the barriers that prevent people from being able to get residency. Deportation orders, unlawful presence, marijuana convictions. We have to be specific and exactly what we're asking for because you can hold TPS with those things. You can hold DACA with those things. And if we don't remove those barriers, then these people will not have an opportunity to obtain residency. And we have to educate people on that. Thank you so much, April. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, before I, I talk about the campaign initiatives, I just want to brief you all on who Clinic is, because even before I started working there uh, five years ago, I had no idea who we were, what we did. We are a large organization that has a very large network, over 400 plus affiliate networks that provide legal services in the community, for the community, for immigrants, for TPS holders, for people who are seeking any type of benefit so that they can finally get the residence that you refer to, so they can finally get the citizenship. And so I, I wanna touch upon the fact that we don't get to advocate on the legislative level, which is very important because those are our lawmakers putting out those bills. Um, but on the administrative level, which is appealing to the, the agencies such as DHS, Department of Homeland Security, Department of State, USCIS, those folks also have the ability to put in place policies and regulations that affect those migrants who are coming through the border, that affect people's ability to apply for any type of humanitarian benefit that allows them to stay here. And so one of the campaign initiatives that my colleague is working on, I myself personally do not work on um, you know, DACA or some of the other benefits that we mentioned, but in regards to DACA, I wanna talk about the Dreamers because they are a special case, I think. They are folks who came here unknowingly um, set up for failure. And I think we owe them as a nation to set them up for success. And we have the ability to do that. Our president has the ability to do that. But in order to make that happen, they need to listen to the coalitions and the campaigns that are out there that are pushing for these policies and regulations to be put in place. And so one of the initiatives that my organization is working on is uh, a campaign that is called uh, Here is Home, and then also DED for DACA. And DED, which is Deferred Enforcement Departure, isn't necessarily a pathway to citizenship, but it allows those who are seeking some type of benefit to remain here for a temporary period of time lawfully so that they can figure themselves out, so that they can have a future for themselves. So my colleague works alongside many other um, advocates, you know, immigration advocates, as well as coalition groups, and together they get together collaboratively, whether it's making grassroots efforts or putting out those sign-on letters, and they work to promote and advocate on behalf of immigrants. So my colleague is currently working on a policy brief, and that policy brief will educate a community at large in terms of what they can do um, right now to make a difference in their community, whether it's on the state and local level, or whether it's going directly to the agencies, or whether it's going directly to Congress and saying, hey, something needs to be done. And so they continue day in, day out, to work together to put out these um, recommendations, if you will. So the policy brief will touch upon recommendations that these agencies can take. Um, sometimes they consider them, sometimes they don't. Um, but the, the important thing is that they're hearing from us. They're hearing from the directly impacted. And so um, I will touch upon, as we go further on in, in our um, discussion, a little bit more about what we do. Um, clinic serves a myriad of different um, um, immigrants, whether they're seeking citizenship, whether they're seeking asylum, whether they're coming in on a visa for religious worker purposes, um, whether they are a survivor of violence, we help them all. We do a lot of education um, through our training and technical assistance program and on the state and local level as well. So um, I'll stop there and I'll let uh, uh, can you continue? Yes. Thank you. Just briefly. Um, 
I, I just realized we've been talking about TPS, but we didn't actually say what TPS is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, I thought I would just quickly. Uh, so TPS is uh, temporary protected status. It is a form of humanitarian relief that the US will give um, a country, will designate to a country when conditions in that country make it safe for people to be deported to that country. So um, um, there are three categories that the US will look at to make that determination. So either there is um, ongoing armed conflict in a country, there is um, environmental disaster, so an earthquake, um, a, a hurricane, um, or third, a, a temporary but extraordinary condition. So for example, um, in 2014, when Ebola broke out in um, West Africa, uh, uh, the U.S. gave uh, TPS to Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. So um, that's a little bit about, about uh, TPS. When a country is designated for TPS, um, then all nationals from that country who are living in the U.S. Um, are eligible to apply for protection from deportation, and they are elig eligible for um, work authorization. Um, the status lasts for 18 months. And um, after um, two, two, 60 days before it expires, DHS is supposed to review the, the country conditions and make a determination about whether it's going to extend TPS or terminate it. So I just wanted to thank you for informing. Thank you. Um, so Diana, the question next is actually for you. So on Africa Day last year, um, ACT and several other immigration rights organizations, the Nigerian Center, we were also there, led a week of action involving the TPS campaigns on Capitol Hill and media. Um, since then, what changes have occurred um, for the community in terms of immigration policies? Sure, um, so that event, um, we focused on TPS, um, highlighting specifically TPS campaigns for African countries, um, because there are several um, um, African countries um, that, were, that we believe warrant a TPS or DED designation. Um, and so we were uplifting uh, those campaigns. And since that, um, since that event, we've seen a, an extension and redesignation of TPS for Sudan, um, uh, same thing for South Sudan, um, and Cameroon. Um, currently, we're working to extend and redesignate TPS for, um, for Ethiopia. Um, Benga mentioned in his remarks about the, um, the TPS event we were at where they pulled up the number of people that um, had TPS, um, you know, were, were, became eligible for TPS under the Biden administration. As it relates to Africans, um, prior to Biden taking, off, taking office, um, less than a thousand Africans were eligible for TPS. And after, um, um, you know, the several designations, uh, and redesignations made by the Biden administration. Now, for up to 45,000 Africans are eligible for TPS. Oh. Um, so that's 45,000 Africans who might not have status, who now have access to protection from deportation, who now have access to work authorization so that they can take care of themselves and their families. And um, you know, there's, 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 we're working to increase that number. Um, Nils talked about DRC. Um, if we get this TPS for DRC, that's potentially another 17,000 um, Africans who will be protected. And DED for Nigeria. And DED, and that would awesome. be a big number. Yes. So. <laughs> Thank you so much, Diana. Nils, yes. you already kind of went over this, but we'll, we'll give it a try. What is the status of TPS for DRC campaign um, and given the ongoing conflict in DRC and how does the Congolese American community wish to be engaged by the U.S. government? Yeah, so there's, there's definitely uh, a, a need for, for education <clears throat> regarding the, the conflict in the DRC. Um, and uh, and that's, that's, that's what we've been focusing on the, the past couple of months. Um, I, I think, as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you often see uh, the armed conflict in the East, uh, you often see that uh, much, much more uh, much more often in, in the media, in the news, than uh, what's happening uh, throughout the country or in, in other regions uh, uh, within the country. So it, it's important for uh, government agencies uh, to, to know that the conflict in the DRC is not isolated. 
or concentrated only in one um, uh, part of the, the country. So it, it, it spread throughout the country. Um, and um, it, again, as I said, one way that people can, can contribute to our effort is to um, really e educate, as, as, as um, uh, the speakers mentioned here, there is, there is that, that can make a big difference in terms of uh, moving forward with, with these campaigns uh, where when uh, uh, the authorities uh, do, not, do not understand what, what's going on on the ground. So, so it's, it's important to continue that, that education. Um, and also, as I said, there are opportunities uh, for organizations to, to uplift the, the, the campaign through letters and, and, and social media and, and outreach. Thank you, thank you. April, um, are there specific federal or state policy interventions that may make a difference in the type of immigration um, cases you are seeing at the Nigerian Center? Absolutely. Um, because Nigerians have such a high level of education, um, EB2 visas are very, very good for Nigerians and the entire African community. I was being funny, but nobody laughed. <laughs> um, but the unfortunate part about it is that just because you qualify doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get a visa because there is a delay between qualification and your eligibility for a visa, which means you could get a green card. So one of the federal interventions that would be really useful um, is if they created more visas in that category so that there's not a delay between somebody being approved and their opportunity to apply for residency. Right now, the last approval that I got, the priority date is May, but our visa bulletin is on November. That, so until the visa bulletin, it says November 2022, this person is not going to be able to apply for residency until that visa bulletin reaches May 2023. And the problem is that you have to stay in lawful immigration status that entire time. So if you are a student who's just finishing your degree, or if you're just finishing your OPT, how do you stay in status while you're waiting for that time to come? So one, increase the number of visas in that category. Two, eliminate the unlawful presence restriction off of that visa. Those would be very useful to the African community. Um, Elmora, this question is for you. Recognizing the high level of civic apathy in the African immigrant communities, how is clinic assisting African communities in engaging in policy advocacy? Um, one of the ways that we, we advocate is through storytelling. And so, you know, I know you've heard now, they've, we've talked about TPS and DED, and we worked with Nils and Diana on a faith-based letter in order to create more or shed more light on, on the issues that are happening in DRC. And so one way we do that is by allowing the directly impacted to lead the charge. A lot of times we assume or we think that the thought leaders in these organizations, the ones who are familiar with the, the legal lingo and you know they have all the knowledge, but truly the people who are directly impacted who are going to suffer as a result of these policies are the ones that can come to us with the information and the knowledge to help us advocate on their behalf. So we work collaboratively, collaboratively excuse me, on those efforts. And it's through the directly impacted that we can make those, um, you know, those issues on the ground, for example, what's happening in DRC come to light. Without the storytelling, without those who are directly impacted, without those who can tell us what's actually happening, a lot of times the administrations don't even want to hear from us because they think, well, here they come again. They're just they're just doing what they normally do, which is, you know, they're advocating, they're pushing their sign on letters out. They're asking us to, you know, change this policy, change that policy. But the truth is there are a lot of things happening on the ground in these countries. People are suffering. Children are dying. There are food and water crises happening all over in some of these countries who are we are we're pushing for TPS and DED. But without the storytelling, without hearing from those who are suffering, who are um, you know, going to suffer the negative consequences of what's happening in their country, there will be no TPS or DED. Uh, the administration has no reason to, or no motive or, or any reason to feel compelled to move. And sometimes even with what's happening currently 
in DRZ, for example, the issue, the things that are happening there are so bad and so egregious, and we are still fighting tooth and nail to get the administration to designate DR, uh, I'm sorry, TPS for that country. It doesn't make sense, you know. So one way that we do it is through the storytelling, but also we educate our community. Like I said before, we have a very large network of organizations who come to us and rely on us for education. A lot of times they're just not familiar with the terminology. They don't know everything about TPS. They don't understand all the nuances of how people can obtain these benefits. And what we do is through our either our webinars or our trainings, we educate the community. So it starts by just talking to the community at large, telling them that here are the possible ways that we can help our immigrants um, who are here, and here are the ways that um, you know they can help themselves. They can help themselves through the storytelling, and we can help them by presenting the issues directly to the agencies and to the White House and to whomever, whoever else can make those uh, decisions on their behalf. Um, so. Thank you. Oftentimes, um, social media is such a powerful tool um, for storytelling and advocacy, and I do see a lot of videos that show what's going on presently in DRC, um, but oftentimes those videos don't lead to an action item, and Niels, maybe you can help answer this as well as Honora. Um, how do you think we, what do you think we need to do to get those that create this content on the ground um, to be informed of what we're presently doing here that can help, you know, the citizens that flee our um, Congo to come to the U.S. to amplify because the content is out there we're seeing it but I don't think people know that there's an action item oftentimes you see what's going on but people don't know what to do next so what do you think we need to do to inform those on the ground on how to have our ask yeah I think uh, one of the ways we can we, we, we are actually trying to do that is to incorporate uh, uh, the social media uh, items um, into the way we present the situation to to the to the administration, uh, storytelling is is very powerful. Yeah. Uh, we have had um, impacted members or members uh, of our community who will benefit from TPS. Uh, we have had them join uh, some of the meetings we had with the uh, with congressional offices and the administration, and that's that's really powerful. Yeah. Uh, bringing. Uh, those those impacted members in, in those type of conversations, um, but also uh, I think what we have also seen is that uh, we get we get used to uh, the the bad stuff happening there. I think uh, as Anora said, uh, the the situation is very dire in in the DRC. But you know people are so used to seeing uh, the the same thing or the violence or that situation. Um, happening over and over again. I think we, we get used to uh, we get used to it, and that's a bad habit. I think uh, when we see that, and I think that, uh, as Anora said, uh, 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 comes with education. Um, and and when we see uh, such 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 violence, it should trigger uh, folks to to take actions. Uh, so so one is uh, incorporate storytelling uh, uh, into uh, our congressional or government outreach, uh, but also to um, educating our communities that uh, we should not be uh, getting used to uh, the bad stuff happening to us. And, and what we're seeing on social media should um, even encourage us to advocate for uh, uh, TPS and, and other types of relief that, that will protect our communities. Yeah, it's true. We're really becoming desensitized, and yeah. that's exactly what's happening and educating. Thank you so much for um, your response. Um, April, immigration reform or policy intervention for the diaspora community tends to only revolve around TPS or DED. Um, are there any other options that we are not exploring, and what kinds of policy recommendations should we be making? Uh, so one option that I don't think that we explore enough um, among all African countries is special immigrant juvenile status. Mm -hmm. So depending on which state you're in, the number will be different. For some states it's 18 and below, for some states it's 21 and below. But if you have a child who has been abandoned, abused, or neglected by either one or both of their parents, then they're able to obtain residency through special immigrant juvenile status. 
That could even include if the children are sent to the United States to live with an aunt or an uncle or someone else, that's considered an abandonment. Um, and that is gonna change a little bit from state to state, but that's the general policy. And I don't think that we use that enough because we just tend to think of, well, it's just a family member taking care of our child, um, but they still qualify for that immigration benefit as opposed to going the more difficult route of trying to do an adoption. Um, the SIJS is a much easier route to get residency for these children. Awesome, thank you for that information. Um, oh, can I add one more thing? Please, please. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Neil was talking about how um, some of the things that you show are the, showing that the, the conflict in the DRC is across the entire country. The reason why this is important is because one of the things that asylum requires is that it's not possible for you to internally relocate in your country and be safe. So when you're producing um, articles and making them readily available for people in the DRC to show that it's the entire country that's unsafe, you're providing documents that they can give to their judge in their asylum case or their officer, if it's an affirmative case, to support that. So producing those scholarly articles is very important for an individual to educate um, their decision maker. Elmora, clinic released their 2024 um, policy priorities and access for access to counsel for the immigrant community is a priority. Can you tell us what advocating for state and local budget policies and practices um, to improve access to counsel looks like? Sure, I, I could speak on um, some of the policies um, and regulations. We have a state and local attorney at clinic who Thank God for her, she covers, you know, like 49 states doing all the state and local pushing um, to help those states on the ground. Um, and one way she does that is through educating them on how they can get more funding, how they can help with the bill writing. Um, essentially what happens is in regards to access to counsel is we only think of access to counsel sometimes when we think about deportation and someone needs an attorney to be represented in court. But the truth is access to counsel means counsel from you know the start of your immigration process until the end. It means that you have someone there to be a voice for you, um, even in regards to the most simplest of things like filling out a form that for us may seem like it's a simple act, but for that person who is seeking a benefit, they just need a little bit of assistance. They need a little bit of encouragement. And sometimes we only think that attorneys can represent uh, those who are seeking those benefits, but the truth is clinic has what's called um, a recognition and accreditation campaign and we really are big advocates for this campaign because it allows individuals such as yourselves to become accredited representatives and sometimes I think they get a bad rap and they get, they get a bad light because you have people who are known as notarios who are out there advocating um, or filing petitions for, for immigrants that shouldn't be. Those people are doing things, they have a different motive and they really shouldn't be um, filing anything for anyone. But for those who are really serious about helping immigrants and they didn't go to law school, there's an opportunity and an avenue for them to help immigrants. And so we are really pushing the recognition and accreditation program. We're helping state and local folks on the ground to be more educated and aware of how they can get involved. Um, we have a lot of training programs. We have a program called COIL and through this program it's it's a couple of weeks long and it's a very intense and rigorous program but once they pass that training program they have the opportunity to now be connected through their organization to become an accredited rep and uh, over the, the course of the year they have to maintain that accredited rep, uh, rep status through additional um, training materials making sure they stay on top of their continued education and so clinic helps those folks who are interested in these programs to get more involved um, on the local and state level and so that's just one way that we, we help on that front. Thank you and we're just going to have this last question if each of our panelists could just give information again on websites or how to stay connected before we open the floor for questions. Diana. Sure again our website is africans.us um, and on social media we are at Africans US um, and on our through our website you can join our mailing list um, you can join our membership um, and uh, social media you'll, you'll you know 
stay up to date on, on the issues that we work on. But um, you know, one of the things that I always recommend people start doing and getting comfortable with, um, it's, it can be nerve wracking the first time, but once you do it over and over, it's not, um, is starting to call your member of Congress. Um, just pick up the phone, give them a call, um, tell them if they've done something you like, if they've done something you don't like. Uh, but just get in the habit of really engaging civically. Um, get in the habit of um, you know, having an opinion on what's happening and voicing that opinion. Um, I think that as our numbers increase as Africans here in the US, what I would really love to see is for us to be a, 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 a diaspora that's uh, very civically engaged that's um, very influential, very powerful. Um, and the way that we get there is um, by having a voice and by making sure that our elected officials, the people who we put in power, um, know what we're thinking about the actions that they're taking. Um, and you know, know that there are consequences when they take actions that we don't agree with. Um, so you know, follow us on uh, uh, social media, join our mailing list, and call your member of Congress. Thank you, Diana Mills. Yes, and our website is ccwmusa.com. Um, and as Diana said, it's it's very important that we stay we stay engaged with our elected officials because what we have noticed is that um, African immigrants are not uh, often the priority or always the priority, even when we should be the priority, right? Like think about what's happening. Uh, on the continent, and not only DRC, you have Nigeria, you have uh, Mali, Ethiopia, uh, and 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 when we look at those conditions, um, uh, we're not comparing that to you know what's happening in, in other parts of the world, but we uh, we should be the priority, and and if we are not being uh, if if we are not putting that pressure on uh, our elected officials, on the government, uh, if we are not calling our elected officials, then uh, it, it's easy for them to just to forget about us uh, or, or not uh, make us the priority. So it's important to reach out, reach out, reach out. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you can find us at the nigeriancenter.org. When you go to the website, go to events and you can register to talk with me about different waivers that are available uh, for your green card or if you're outside the United States for too long and you need to come back and your green card is expired. We'll talk about all those kinds of waivers. Um, you can also find on our YouTube page all past uh, seminars that we've done. I did a seminar previously on family petitions, on asylum requirements. You'll also find one um, that gives details on EB2 visas. Um, and if there's anything that you want to see that you don't see on there, just let Benga know, he'll make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you can reach us at cliniclegal.org, that's our web address, and if you go to our website we have an advocacy tab where you can find more information on our federal administrative advocacy as well as state and local issues. We have a ton of resources that are free. You don't have to do anything, you just click on the download tab and you will have access to things such as public comments, sign-on letters, policy briefs. Um, if you are affiliated with or a part of an organization that wants to become part of our affiliate network, there are ways that you can go on there, um, onto the website and click on more information for how you can go about doing that. And if you just want to receive information in real time, you can sign up to be a part of our listservs. We have an email tab on there. You just sign up on the things that interest you and you will start to receive um, emails and action alerts and all sorts of things and ways you can get involved on your end. Thank you. Thank you. Let's talk about all of that. That is a wealth of information, and I'm going to open the floor to you um, to ask any questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Tobago Alim Takuma Park Maynard. I'm originally from Ethiopia. I've lived in this land for a long time. I've raised two of my children. For all the practical purposes, I'm a true African and migrant American. My question is you all talked about calling Congress, that is exercising our political capital. But unfortunately, that political capital, the power of that political capital is directly related to the amount of civic engagement. Right now, 
If that political capital is a card, it has zero balance. So this is uh, for Nigerian uh, center. What is that you do to mobilize our community to wake up and be active in the political process of this great land? If you don't vote, if you don't know who your representative is, I, I wonder how many of us know what district we live in. I wonder how many of us know who our representative is. I wonder how many of us have donated to our representative. I, by the way, calling Congress? No, it's not calling Congress. Every congressman has a district office, and the district office is the constituency service provider. You have to know who that person is. You have to call them. You have to go there. Later, have to be written to the principal, but you have to send an email. You have to go. You have to be active. But first and foremost, you have to get involved. I'm an activist. I don't see African Africans visible in the political capital building process. We all come when there is an issue. Your power is directly proportional to our political capital. So the question to the Nigerian Center, what are you doing to make sure, by way of seeking of engagement, to awaken our community, to support our community, so that they can vote, they can get in, engaged. So we come to this land, taking away from our motherland. Our motherland taught us so much. We're educated, you say, the Nigerians, all Africans are educated. <laughs> and the poor Africans pay for our education. Yeah, yeah. We're living in this land. The question is, that is not known. So the civic engagement is very, very crucial. So yes. I'm just, I'm not necessarily asking, I'm just expressing. <laughs> yes, sir, but thank you so much because yeah. that is the sole purpose of events like yeah. this, is to open an opportunity to literally inform our community. Um, and something that the Nigerian Center is actually quite literally doing is community to capital um, series where we try to educate, we do educate our community. We had one and we had Diana, you know, hold a call where she informed our community just that the process of reaching out to your congressional members and what civic engagement looks like. We will be picking that up and we do have town halls concerning some of our policy priorities like TPS. We informed our community of what is TPS. A lot of them didn't know what it was and the importance of getting engaged. And that's why we have things like the State of the Union on Immigration. Um, the purpose, as I mentioned in the beginning, is to inform and educate our community on what's going on. And that's why we specifically posted these panelists because we know they are on the field doing the work and they could also further inform everyone that's here. And hopefully we take this out and send the recording out when it's, uh, when it's available to inform our community on what's going on. So this is an educational uh, meeting. And um, Actually, I forgot to start my question by saying thank you for this event. Oh. You got me out of Takuma Park. Oh. I don't come out and listen to this event. Thank you for thank coming, you. sir. Uh, thank, thank, you. thank you. And thank you for yeah. being committed yeah. and interested in yeah. educating our community on um, civic engagement. Thank you. Can I also yes. add that is 100% um, correct. Yes. And um, I also want to add some of the other work that we're doing at African Communities Together. Um, part of it is exactly that, getting our communities to be more engaged civically. So in addition to the policy which um, you know I'm, I'm involved with, we also have a civic engagement program where we knock on doors, um, you know, telling Africans about uh, elections coming up, why they should be voting, what is on the ballot, um, and we do it um, in a way that makes it accessible for our community. So we have a civic engagement here in uh, Virginia. Um, we knock on doors um, and our organizers are, um, speak the languages of the communities. So they can go to the, to the door and knock and you know, know who, you know, have a sense of who's living at that house. Um, and then you know, uh, if they need to, speak Amharic. Um, when the person opens the door, or um, Arabic, or whatever the case might be, and that makes it um, that makes people feel more comfortable. That creates more trust. Um, so that's one of the things that we do. Um, uh, in addition to that, we are involved in organizing our community. So um, we, you know, we bring people in through our our services, and then tell them about the advocacy that we're doing. Um, and develop them into leaders by providing trainings on you know, how to lobby your member of Congress, how to have conversations with them. We train them on you know, media, um, how to talk to the press, how to talk to, um, you know, do a, a, an interview, 
we teach them, um, you know, we help people write comments um, for, uh, uh, you know, when there are bills coming up, providing comments, uh, providing testimonies, um, all of these things, it's, it's not a one thing. You have to be engaged in everything. You have to know what's going on because everything affects all of our lives. From the air we breathe, the water we drink, uh, we focus on immigration, um, but there are other issues, or I should say, I focus on immigration here, but we have housing. Um, there is um, a, a building in Alexandria right now where um, they're trying to displace um, the residents, most of them being Africans, most from Ethiopia and Sudan, um, and we're fighting against that. But most people don't know that that's happening, um, and you don't know unless you're, you're, you're engaged. So I just wanted to add that, that Thank you for that. And one way that we can all do programs like this justice is by connecting with our community, informing. Uh, will you receive information from the Nigerian Center or when you sign up with the list server, sending it out? Um, because there can't just be a small group of people doing this work. As we inform, you all help to amplify the work that is going on. So thank you, sir, for that question. Um, does anyone else have a question? Yes, please. Hi, my name is Faitia. I am uh, currently a freshman at Georgetown University, and I just want to say, first of all, thank you guys so much for putting on this event. This was very uh, informative. My question is specifically to the Nigerian Center, but honestly, anybody can really answer. How would you, what are some specific ways for like young adults like me to like help with this cause for you know for us that don't necessarily have like, the qualification or education uh, background for this of this uh, of this work, but but we're very passionate about you know, activism, uh, activism work and advocacy work. What are some ways that you guys can get involved in help further? Well, with the Nigerian Center, thank you for your question and thank you for coming. With the Nigerian Center, you can get involved by volunteering, signing up to be a volunteer. We do a lot of work and we are looking for as much chance to help assist with the work that we're doing. So that's one way you can get involved with the Nigerian Center. Uh, we do set a lot of information out, so making sure you're on our listserv um, to find out about all the events. We do a lot of events and seeing how you can be engaged um, in other way you can get involved. Um, irrespective of your degree or whatever, please, all hands on deck with the work that we're doing. So thank you. And I would like to talk to you at the end of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else have a question? Yes, um, talk about engagement on the Capitol Hill. Um, is there any engagement with both parties and not just one party? If it's just, I mean, from my experience or just from my observation, if you're engaging with one party, that party can take you for granted. Um, and then it's not always that that one party is in power, um, the power changes all the time. So um, is there any uh, engagement with both parties, even though? Another party could not be pro immigration, but at least uh, kind of get uh, you're in the air. Yeah, so you know, we are a C3, so we, uh, it doesn't matter, we just care about immigration. Um, and I have found that, um, or I should say, we just care about pro immigration <laughs> uh, policies. So, regardless of party, that's what we want to see. Um, and what I have found, um, uh, particularly with our issues, um, Africa tends to be an issue, uh, you know, like, yeah, I'll say Africa generally tends to be an issue that's bipartisan. Um, you can find Africa champions on the right and Africa champions on the left. Um, and so for TPS, for example, um, knowing that there are, um, you know, Republicans that care deeply about Africa, what's happening there, um, that can, that's usually an in for us um, to be able to go into those meetings and say, you know, I know that you care about what's happening. Um, these are some of our priorities. Um, you know, how can we work together? And, you know, in, in 2019, under President Trump, we got uh, green cards for Liberians. We got that because of support of Republicans during the Trump administration. Um, and so you're correct. It's not about you know one party or another. It's about who's going to give you what you want. I saw a hand here. Yes, 
Um, so my name is Mona Mage Willie. This is my vice chair, Kina Anya. We're both from Montgomery County. Yeah. Our neighbors <laughs> <laughs> um, representing the African Affairs Advisory Group in Montgomery oh. County. Um, thank you for sharing this. We learned about it from an African Communities Together online meeting. So the connections, the community <laughs> partnerships are happening. Yeah. Um, so I think I want to do two things. Acknowledge something that we feel is really, I felt was really important that was shared. One of which being the transition from only thinking about immigration as a Latino issue to an everyone issue. We saw that happen in real time in Montgomery County where there was an immigrant um, board specified solely to address the community, the issues of the Latino community, excluding Africans. And so I think that that's really important to acknowledge how that shift needs to happen because immigration is not just impacting a few countries in Latin America. And that Africans are coming up from the South which leads to my question. Montgomery County is seeing an influx of immigrants from Gambia, Mauritania, Senegal, and Mali, just to name a few. And people are within the county are mobilizing when they see someone on the street, sorry, they literally mobilize to pick them up off the streets and house them. We had our county executives say publicly, listen, Montgomery County folks don't even have housing themselves. How can we help immigrants coming in here get housing when we don't have enough housing for our own people? And so my question is, I think legislation is really key and critical, but it takes years to lock into place. And so how can community partners and the different organizations mobilize now to help folks uh, coming up from the South, from these respective countries, receive the basic necessities as they work to file for example? All right. I don't want to take up all the space, so I'm going to let somebody else, but you know. So one way uh, we, have, we have dealt with uh, those type of situations of people coming uh, <clears throat> through the border and with, with limited resources is that we, uh, our, our community has developed uh, partnerships with so many other organizations uh, that can provide uh, uh, resources for uh, recent arrivals. Uh, and and, and that, that, that's very critical because um, as you probably can imagine, uh, our communities, our organizations have, have limited resources, but I think if we work together, I think we can uh, definitely uh, meet and overcome uh, those, those type of challenges. I don't think that you, I think you should push back on the idea that there is a finite amount of housing available. They're trying to make the argument that if there's no housing for Montgomery County residents, then we can't house immigrants. But they could house Montgomery County residents if they wanted to. There are empty commercial buildings that can be converted into apartments. So like when they make that kind of argument, it's disingenuous to begin with. Yeah. Also, one thing to add. We, uh, we, are, we were also looking into what can be done uh, locally uh, in terms of uh, uh, policies that, that can affect uh, you know, immigrants. Uh, in Virginia, for example, uh, asylum applicants uh, are, are not eligible for institutions. So regardless of how long you've lived in the state, uh, um, how long you've paid taxes, we have people who have as, as the president said in the, in the State of Union uh, speech, asylum cases can now take years. Uh, so, and, and during that time, people are um, paying taxes, contributing uh, economically to the state, and, and we believe that they, they deserve that, that institution status. And institution status can make a big difference uh, in, in, in how uh, people can, can, can access uh, higher education. Um, so uh, in Virginia, we are looking into ways uh, we can um, uh, have uh, a policy change to, to make uh, asylum applicants uh, eligible for in-state tuition. Um, as, you, as you probably know, it, it, it's a huge difference in-state versus out-of-state, I think three or four times uh, uh, higher. So, so, and I think it's a good practice to start looking into what can be done locally because we know that the federal government um, moves um, tend to move slower than uh, the, the state and local government. So um, yeah, so that's one of the initiatives that we're also working on. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? Yes. Yes, sir. 
Yeah, I guess a commentary to the question. I also want to highlight this concept of um, impact investing and investing in change. Any meaningful progress or change happens because people actually committed resources to it. Mm. And in African communities, we have the culture of philanthropy towards community, family members, our churches, our mosques, our synagogues, but rarely do we see the same commitment has to go to community organization and put our financial resources to elevate and, up, uh, and, and uh, undergird activists on the field. Uh, and also, I don't know how, we also have to communicate it that little tiny dollars, though we have congressional members, council members running for public offices, and we celebrate the successes, but can we even do that with our financial resources to support them? That said, I want to recognize <laughs> Dr. Moye <laughs> Moye. <laughs> Uh, thank you, sir, for the work that you do. But in addition to volunteering, I think we also have a culture of investing in change. That meaningful change takes financial investments and also take boots on the ground. Both have to go hand in hand. Yeah. And that would help that volunteer apathy that you talked about. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Benga. Um, I hope that answered your question. Um, does anyone else have a question? So I just want to ask each, you know, all the panelists, you know, in your data analysis, what have you seen about programs outside of the Salem and TPS that you've either seen or worked on or heard about um, that tracks our data and compare it? Because America only works on, you know, they say if something is good, then you're going to compare it, right? So that you can, you can be better, right? So when we're out there just pushing programs that Latinos already have, right? For instance, Dakar, the, the Hispanic Caucus says seven out of 10 Dakar recipients is Latino. How do we track our own programs? Is there a program where we can be like, in this program, this out of this is this, in this, da 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 Meanwhile, the, the, the Asian caucus says, it's still with Dakar, three out of 10. Where does that put Africans? Less than 5%? 4,000, exactly. Of out of 700,000. So, so thank you. 600,000. Thank you. Yeah. Please. 4,000 Africans. I don't know if there's a question in there, but the question is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the data can you share with us? that shows the disparity when it comes to immigration relief. Thank you. Well, you're, Diane's <laughs> gonna talk, but I'll say one thing first. You can track asylum by country of origin. You can track it by judge, and you can track it by state as well. Um, and depending on what state you're in, what's interesting to me is that asylum is a federal policy, but depending on what state you're in, there is a huge disparity in whether or not your asylum case might get granted. So that's something that you can find online on the D DOJ website. Does clinic check that? Are you with clinic? No, no I'm, I'm, I'm with oh, clinic. Oh. No. Um, currently, I can't say that we are tracking specifically in regards to African clinic countries. Clinic checks a lot of Latinos, though. So you already have all of the data. So well, the tools. If you let me answer, um, okay. I can say that you know we do our own work in house to track uh, or gather data from our affiliate networks. And so one of the things we're doing this year is having quarterly roundtable discussions and we are asking for the affiliates to show up and tell us and talk to us and tell us what are the issues you are seeing there on the ground because that, de that varies from you know, state to state and it varies from community to community. Not every community that you show up in is gonna have issues with you know, um, the lack of care and concern that we have towards African uh, migrants, but in another state, you may have that issue. And so what we need from our community is for them to show up and say, here's what we're dealing with, here's what we're facing. You know, we can put out the survey, but it requires participation from people there. What about the DHS data? Well, yeah. I don't have DHS data. So I'm not DHS. So, so it's unique, right? That's where you get your data for the Latinos. You get it from DHS. So my question is, for instance, instead of the union, you know, all each and every one of those members of Congress, they share who their guests are gonna be. Right, and for many years, Clinique will put out statements to say, oh, and today they're doing you know, such and such DACA recipients. So I know the clinic tracks data when it comes to Hispanic, right? So my question is, which organizations are tracking that kind of publicly available data? Not, not putting the onus on us with the wealth gap and, 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 and every, you know, the grant, but the data's already out there. It's just, you know, I was just wondering, like, just like any other, uh, uh, like the Latinos track it, the Asians track it, those are the tools, all they have to do is just, you know, 
pull it out for, for Africa, but no one does it. So not that no one does it, we don't do it to the extent right, that other groups do it. So anyway, I was just throwing that out there. Thank you. I do want to say that for Africans, actually a lot of data doesn't exist, and that's part of the problem. Um, you know, we, there was recently a um, New York Times story about Africans at the border, um, coming to the border, and they um, um, cited some data that, you know, in FY 2022, uh, fiscal year 2022, there were about 13,000 Africans that came to our southern border. Um, FY 23, that number jumped to 58,000. Um, but when you go to DHS's website about the nationalities coming to the border, Africans are all lumped in other. Um, and so I've reached out to DHS and said, you know, can I get the data on the Africans showing up at the border? Because as at, at you know my organization, we would like to see the trends so that we know, um, you know, if it's Guineans coming to the border, Burkina Bay, uh, you know, Mauritanians. We want to know because a lot of what we're seeing is a lot of them end up in New York. We want to know, you know, uh, how we can best serve them. We want to know what kind of advocacy we can do, maybe around like language access about people at the border. But even that information, it's not easily accessible. Um, but then to your point, the data that we do have, we do see the disparities. And it's actually the, the data you cited um, around humanitarian parole, there actually was one country I think it was Uganda, but the parole program was not to get Africans out of um, Uganda. I think it was um, either Asian American or not Asian Americans, but uh, Asians or, or um, uh, uh, some other group um, to get them to come to the U.S. So even when it is an African country, it doesn't benefit um, Black Africans. Um, and another point on data you know, the disparities that we see from the data that's, that's available. I tried to pull it up on the DHS website, but I couldn't get to it. But, um, and you know, I think that we all know this from, um, from just being Africans and anecdotally, it's so hard to get a visa to come to the US. Um, and if you look at the data, you will see it in the data. Um, um, when you look at the uh, non-immigrant visas, so that's temporary visas, uh, or folks coming to the US, every year there are millions of people who come to the US from all the regions. Africa, it's of those, of, of the millions of people who are coming to the US, 1% are from Africa, 1%. So it, we, we're not even getting visas to come here. Um, one of the issues that we're working on right now is some of the um, delays that people get to the, at, when, they, when they apply for um, visas, they don't get interviews for a year, two years later. Um, if you're coming for a, congress, for a conference, what's the point? Like, you know, if you're coming for somebody's wedding, what's the point? So, I mean, yeah, to your point, I mean, there is no data. But when there is data, we do see a large discrepancy. Um, and unfortunately, it is up to small nonprofits to either find the data um, or really push to get data. But, you know. Or we can tell Latino organizations when they come to us talking about Black History Month yeah. to tell them you can take this data and put it in infographics, right? Not just looking for the token blacks that are part of. You know that one percent, like oh, see, you know, black people have they, you know, that car. No, how about some of this one percent and do that kind of big outreach that they do for every single Latino country? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, just just a very very quick comment on that. Uh, last year we found talking about data. Last year we found that <clears throat> DRC was the, the the country with the highest number of uh, refugees in, in the US. And, and on that list, I think the top, uh, in the top five, there were uh, Afghanistan, Burma, Ukraine. And all of them, uh, uh, or most countries on that list, had TPS. And DRC 
even when we have uh, the highest number of refugees in the U.S., but we don't have TPS. I think, I think also what makes uh, this this work hard is um, the fact that there is foreign policy involved. Very often we we look at DHS uh, and and uh, without really, you know. I, I, bottom line is that we have to work holistically, right? Like involving state departments. Uh, and, and other agencies, uh, and, and even now we are finding that with uh, some of the, the, on the decision for TPS designations, uh, the, the other agencies are also heavily involved. Uh, so, so we have to address uh, these, these, these issues holistically, uh, looking at foreign policies and, 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 and even local policies.
Okay. All right. Uh, my name is Oye again. I'm the U.S. representative of Washington, D.C. But I'm also a pharmacist in my day, day life. Um, run for office. <laughs> Become a policymaker. Because most of the people who uh, write our policies on healthcare have no experience in healthcare. So they're beholden to lobbyists who hopefully can write the best bills. So um, having someone who's been in the foxhole who can understand not only from the lawmaking room, also on the front lines of healthcare, know what makes sense and what doesn't, will help a lot. I also want to piggyback on Bellow's question, because you asked a lot of questions. And one of the questions you asked was about the State of the Union and how many Africans were there. Um, besides Congress members, not. Um, but you also made a question, had a point about comparing Africans to the Latino community. It's a difficult one, because in the DC area, it's about 192,000 Africans, 800,000 Latinos. USA, maybe 2.1 Africans, 82 million Latinos. They not only create a voting block, they will collapse the economy if they're not here. So rather than having us versus them, I think a more beneficial or possible beneficial option is joining them. I mean, um, equity. It doesn't no. have to be the same amount. Just whatever our percentage is. That should be the same percentage. I'm, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. The reason why I was late today is because I was actually at an event where the um, Latino DC, members of the Latino members in the DC area, they're, we just passed a bill two years ago that allowed non-citizens to vote in elections in DC. While everybody else is kind of talking about Super on the Rug, the Latino community in DC are organizing on this issue. I stepped into that room because I wanted Africans to be in that conversation as well. Even if you know, we're not a big percentage. If we're aligned with that voting block, we can get those resources. Ask Benga, the African Affairs, um, African Affairs Office in the Mayor's Budget got $200,000. The Latin one got $5 million. This is where relationships are. If we can get into that room by their side, they can't ignore us because we're part of that group. So um, I think a big thing we can do is build those relationships we have a lot more in common than we do different. When we get pulled over by the police, they don't say Baoni. We need to make sure that they see us as partners so we can't get ignored. Can you repeat that DC bill? Yeah, um, in 2022, they passed a bill that non citizens in DC can vote for local elections, like the mayor, yeah. the council, um, ANC commissions. My race is federal, it's not voted, they can't vote for mine. But the important thing is that they can't ignore our issues because we could be the difference between a council member getting elected. We could be the difference between a mayor getting elected. And not just voting, but also the resource we get. So when we activate and we're allowed, and then we also have the money that we can possibly donate first, or even threaten to donate against them, then we're not just looked at as peons. Then we're not just looked at as people who are not involved. And I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank you so much, Ben, for, for creating these opportunities because the conversation begins somewhere. And this is the beginning of the conversation. I see a full room of 40 people, but we probably control about 20,000 people. You'll be the healthcare worker, you probably touch the lives of 5,000 people a week. And that is really what these conversations are about. That's a good question. All right. So again, the theme for this State of the Union on Immigration was African diaspora's engagement in immigration policy. I think the underlying theme, or out of what everyone was saying today, was there is power in us coming together and being loud about the work that we are doing. Um, I think from everything from the questions that Ms. Bello asked for about data, it's all about us coming together and being loud about our ask. Um, and it just cannot be those of us that are in this room. As we are joining this event today, you know, go out into your communities and spread the words about these forums. And we don't only have these forums to discuss, we literally have action plans on how people can get involved and spread the word. So thank you all so much for coming tonight. One, one more thing. Yes, sir. That title was powerful branding. Thank you. That got my attention. Oh, State okay. of the Union Immigration. Keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> That concludes the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.